What's up, guys? It's your boy Zawoki back out with some more of the Chris Watts and Nicole Kessinger videos. And with popular demand, and I'm talking popular, you guys have been blowing up my Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, asking me to rewatch and react, which I have been waiting for. Annie Elise, 10 to Life. Chris Watts admits the murders that were planned the day before. I still think that was a little bit sooner than that. Blames Nicole Kessinger for everything. This woman is like one of the top people when it comes to crime analysis and so forth like that. And I definitely do love her channel. So with that being said, we're going to watch it, react to it, and so forth like that. But before we go any further, if you guys could do me a solid favor and subscribe to my YouTube channel by hitting that white bar icon down at the bottom right hit that bell icon next to it so when i do post videos like this one you guys will get that little ring notification that i've posted that video and then you guys can watch comment like and share and again thank you so very much for the love and support you guys continuously show on this channel also make sure you guys check out the link in the description if you guys have not already gone to annie elise tend to life go give her some love do the thing subscribe comment like and share this woman definitely has been around the block when it comes to all things crime uh i should, probably shouldn't have said it like that she is the one to go to on the block that's better of crime uh true crime and so forth like that so with that being said and without further ado let's get into the video life with me annie elise i hope you guys are having a great start to your day today because i'm probably about to ruin it um this is a case that we always hate talking about i always swear i'm never gonna go back to watts island and then she something does. just like mm, yanks and i'm i i can't say that i've tried to get away but i've asked if you guys want me to look into other things which i have but if you guys want me to stop doing the watts case and you guys just keep wanting me to do more and more and more with this case so we're going to continue. Mix me in like some sort of virus. I don't even know. But with that being said, I feel like we all probably know this case like the back of our hands, right? Because today we are talking about none other than the family killer, Chris Watts. I would love to have like a um, live broadcast just talking to her and picking her brain about this case. Like it would be so much fun. Now here's the deal. I've done a few videos in the past talking about Chris, but more specifically going over all of the absolutely insane red flags when it comes to his mistress oh, yeah. Nicole Kessinger like I said I know that this case is extremely well known but for those of you who may have for some off chance never heard about it before I am going to do a quick which there are people that still don't know I literally met somebody yesterday that never knew about this case until watching my videos which was kind of shocking but I kind of told him I was like you don't stop at my channel i'm like there are hundreds of channels that have great deep dives i have them all in my descriptions so check them out but yeah they literally didn't know about this case until my video so very very quick high level summary about the case before we then dive into the new updates the whole reason why i'm even creating this video and all of the updates that have recently come out and what else has been happening since chris's arrest and his sentencing in 2018. He's so guys very good. let's I can tell you that just right jump now. right in <laughs> She's also got a podcast, a uh, serialologist or something like that. It's really good. I like listening to it from time to time. She's got that YouTube play button like I want. Oh, I want it so bad. Get ready with me to go to bed. I'm already in my jammies. I start my bedtime routine around 7.30 because I like to be asleep by 8.30. Now, I wear my aura ring every single day because not only does it track my habits, but it tracks my sleep, which... Okay, I'm guessing this is probably a sponsorship, but who can be in bed by 8.30? I'm not in bed until like 11 midnight because I'm too busy making YouTube videos. But yeah, this is probably just um, a sponsorship, which we're just going to skip via. There we go. 2010 and married in 2012. They lived in Colorado and they had two little girls, Bella, who was four years old, and Celeste, who's three Cutest years old. They girls. had a picture-perfect marriage. Shanann was very active on social media and posted videos all of the time of them as a... There are people, or I shouldn't say people, there are men that would kill to have the wife of Shanann and the life that they have built, these guys. There are men that would kill for this. And he just threw it away. 
For what? All because of a mistress. And there's going to be comments going, he didn't kill for Nicole. He literally said, if it wasn't for Nicole, my family would be, or my family would be still here. The family singing, happy, joking around together. She even posted a video about how she and Chris met and how he slid into her DMs and friend requested her on Facebook years ago, how she didn't think anything of it, and then bam, now here they are and they're married and they have two kids. So really, from the outside, a perfect love story. But things aren't always what they seem, are they? No, on August 13th, 2018, Shanann returned home from a business trip in Arizona and Chris was at home with the girls. It was a solo work trip for her and she came home about 1.45 a.m. The next morning, a colleague of hers became concerned because Shanann had missed an OB appointment and she was 15 weeks pregnant. Thank she God also was Nicole failing to return Atkinson. any text messages and this was very much unlike Shanann. So her friend went to Shanann's house at noon to check in to make sure everything's okay, maybe she overslept, and no answer. She ends up calling Chris and before even asking Chris to notify the police, it's she like, just takes it upon them. herself because she knew it was so out of character for Shanann that she's like, no, I'm calling the police. Something's going on here. At 1.40 p.m., an officer arrived to do a welfare check and Chris was now back at the house at this point as well. And Chris allowed the officer to come in, search for information, see what he could find, anything to determine, okay, where is Shanann and our two little girls? None of the family was found and police found her purse, her wedding ring, her shoes. Her car was there, which still had the girl's car seats in it, and her cell phone, which was in her purse. Very unlike her, everything is showing that she should have been at the house because all of her belongings were still there and the girl's belongings. So where was this family? The next day, the FBI joined the investigation, and Chris gives this huge interview on the news, pleading for them to come home for their safe return, just laughing while he's doing of it. Love and support from the community, trying to find his pregnant wife and their two little girls. At every light in the house on, I was hoping that I would just get. <laughs> just ran over by the kids running in the door and just like barrel rushing me, but it didn't happen. And it was just a traumatic night trying to be here. I just, I just want them to come back. As the I'm not even gonna say it. Police are doing their investigation on the property and around the neighborhood. A neighbor comes out and says, you know what? I've actually got video cameras on my property. Do you wanna come in and take a look? They're always recording and maybe and I caught something. Like, so officers are uh, like, of course, yeah, let's go take a look. And Chris comes along as well because he of course wants to see what it is. As the officer, the neighbor and Chris are inside the neighbor's house watching this footage, Chris's behavior starts to become very concerning. The footage shows Chris backing his truck up in the middle of the night into the garage. And he quickly starts getting fidgety, trying to explain it away, saying how there's been a string of break-ins recently, all of these things. But just his behavior, you can see he's just moving and twitching and he can't sit still. Once the footage is over, the officer and Chris go to leave the house and the neighbor pulls the officer back and says, hey, he's not acting right. Because the neighbor knew something was up with his behavior and he said, he's usually cool, We all knew. He isn't acting right. You know what's funny is a lot of us, including the neighbors, Nicole Atkinson, we all knew. But there's a lot of us that know that Nicole was involved. We just have that hunch. We have that, we have that inner feeling that Nicole was involved. And yet we can't do anything about it because it is locked down tight to being closed. Something's up. Here's info real quick. No. which immediately, of course, piqued the interest of the police officers. The police bring Chris in for questioning, which they so often do with spouses, and they also ask him to take a polygraph test, which he fails. So after he fails, they really start pressing him. Terribly, because you're supposed to get a negative four. He got a negative 18. What was going on in the marriage? Were you guys fighting? And as they continue to push, Chris finally admits that he was having an affair. He says, it was just an affair. It didn't mean anything. I love my wife. I would never be involved in something like this. I would never hurt my children. And just keeps denying, denying, denying. Then the officers, very, very smart officers, decide, you know what? We're gonna bait him a little bit. We're gonna see if we can give him just enough rope to hang himself. And that's what they did. They said, Chris, look, you failed the polygraph. You were having an affair. Your stories aren't adding up. We have this footage of you backing your truck up into the garage in the middle of the night. Things aren't looking right, so just tell us the truth. And so they ask, did you see Shanann hurt the girls? And then did you go after 
Four months later, on November 6th, they accept the plea deal and he pleads guilty. Two weeks later is the sentencing stupid. and it is a media frenzy. Both families are there. Everybody's emotionally invested in this case. Chris is allowed the opportunity to speak and to address the room and address the court. He doesn't, like a coward. He gets sentenced three life sentences plus 86 years for the unlawful termination of their unborn child. Four months later, out of nowhere, Chris reaches out to the original investigators and says, you know what, I'm gonna answer your questions and I'm ready to speak. So they wanna take this opportunity and learn, okay, what was the truth? We know your story in the beginning was complete bullshit, but what really happened? He starts explaining to them that he's been a go with the flow kind of guy his entire life. He's never had a temper, that he and Shanann's marriage, there was never any sort of domestic and that things were always happy. And then his story starts turning a little bit and he starts saying how he started to resent her because he hated being in all of these social media posts that she would do related back to her work and that he supported her so he did it but that he really hated feeling like he was always put on stage. And he explains that. So if you didn't like it, all you had to do was sit there and go to your, your wife and tell her, hey, I, I'm not really feeling this. I mean, it's like my fiance. She doesn't like to be in the spotlight. Do I purposely put her in there because to make her feel uncomfortable? No, I make her feel comfortable by not putting her in there. I guarantee Shanann would have done the same thing. All you had to do was communicate. He couldn't even do that. He wants to sit there and blame her for everything again. That's how the affair really started. And that when she got back from her work trip that night, she suspected something was going on. She initiated sex with him and he says he did it and he felt like it was a test to see if he really was cheating or not. And just that she really knew something was up. Then he explains how he told her that he doesn't love her anymore. He wanted a divorce. And in retaliation, she says, well, you will never see the girls again. And then he says it was that comment that sprung him into action. <clears throat> which I always think that it's completely stupid that he wants to sit there and say that um, that's what made him snap. But if you would, if she tells you, I'm going to take them away, your first idea to fix things or get things taken care of is to murder them yourself. It's like the whole stupid quote. If I can't have him, then nobody can, or like something to that effect. I just, his ideas are so stupid. Action where he just jumped on top of her and started strangling her. But then as he's recounting all these events, he slips and he actually says he already had it in his mind that he was going to do it. So it wasn't something that just came over him in the heat of the moment. He knew that he was going to be doing this. He says he looks to the bedroom door and he sees four-year-old Bella standing there. And she says, what's wrong with mommy? And he says, she's just not feeling well. <laughs> then he carries the two little girls downstairs, loads them in the truck, brings Shanann's dead body into the truck and they head for the oil happened. site. When they get to the oil site, he says he takes three-year-old Celeste's baby blanket and smothers her to death with it, all while Bella was watching. Then Bella turns to him and asks him, Daddy, are you going to do the same thing you just did to Cece to me? I mean, this is heartbreaking. She's a or when she says, Daddy, no, I hope that haunts him for his the rest of his life. Young girl, she's four years old, but she is aware of what's going on. He says that he takes the blanket and he does the same thing to Bella. And he says her last words were, no daddy. He drops the two girls in the oil tanks, not even together, in two separate tanks. And he buries his pregnant wife in the <coughs> shadows of the oil tanks in a dirt patch. This guy, is a heartless sociopath. Now they finally have his true confession. The story is out there. People know what happened, so there can be some sort of level of closure. But sure enough, he starts talking again just a short time later. And this time, he unloads even more bombshells. As he's being interviewed, he says, all I could feel was that at that moment, I was free to be with Nikki, his mistress. He says, nope. my feelings of love for her were so overwhelming, I felt no remorse. He goes on to say he was desperate for Nicole to bear his only son, and hated the idea that Shanann was pregnant with their son, so before he killed her, he actually had tried to poison her to force a termination. And then he goes and recounts the morning of the murder, and he releases even more information that he didn't release before. And this time, it is even beyond what we all thought. He says on the morning of August 13th, before he even had this argument with Shanann or told her that he wasn't in love with her anymore, he went over to the girl's bedroom. He says he used a pillow from their beds to smother them and kill them. After he left the girl's room, he climbed back into bed with Shanann and that's when the argument started. After he murdered Shanann, he looked to the bedroom door and he saw little Bella standing there, which is true because he even said this in his earlier confession. However, he said, 
I didn't know how she was standing there alive. I had just killed her and Cece. Their eyes were bruised and looked as though they had just been through some kind of trauma, and I knew I had failed and I had to do it again. What? By the grace of God, your two little girls just survived this horrific attempted murder. He goes on to- But he loves them so much. I say he threw Shanann's body into the shallow hole that he dug for her and she landed face down but that at that point he hated her so much he wasn't going to bother flipping her over. This guy is so disgusting. As he discusses how he got rid of the two little girls bodies he says he was forced to shove their bodies through an eight inch hole in those paper plate size. About that big. If that. Shoved them in there. I don't know how their little arms were not dislocated or bruised or broken. I don't know how, but that man, this is, this is why I wanted him to have the death penalty. He didn't just murder them just randomly. He like abused them after the fact that they were gone, shoving them in a hole, burying his mistress. This is why I want him to have the death penalty oil tanks and he says quote i can't believe how easy it was to just drop her and let her go in that That's hole sickening. and i knew that she was dead when i heard her splash in the oil he also says how poor sweet little bella was the only one who put up a fight and how she was begging him not to hurt her so now all of this new information has come to light and people have a glimpse of the real true chris watts who is a freaking monster, monster. and now it's time to see okay well what was up with this mistress and was she involved when she revealed her herself to the police and to the media, she said, I barely knew Chris. He completely lied to me. He tricked me. I had no idea. He told me that he was in the middle of a mutual divorce and separation. He never told me that lies, he was still lies, married. Lies. And she also says that they were taking it really slow, had no long-term plans. Taking it really slow, but you're looking up wedding dresses and how to prepare for butt stuff. And I want, man says that he's uh, leaving his wife and marrying his men. You are full of gaka. Okay. And that it was just kind of a casual thing and that she is so appalled by what he's done to his family. And people really believed her because she approached the police before they even had to seek her out for questioning. And so they thought she was very forthcoming, that he really had played her as well. And yeah. she had no idea of anything that was really going on. And then once she saw it on the news, that's when she called the police. And so they said, this is a good woman. She didn't know better. He really played her too. She's also been victimized. I completely 100% respect and agree with Shanann's family, the Rucheks, with their beliefs, their position that Chris is the sole person responsible for the heinous murders of Shanann, Bella, Cece, and Nico. But... Through and through, absolutely. However, I would be remiss if I did not bring up that there are more things about Nicole Kessinger that have surfaced, mm -hmm. and this is after extensive, extensive research. But the reality in all of this is that she was extremely in Chris's life, involved in a relationship so much that she, she actually everything. had literally ridden in Shanann's car. But in her mind, surely the detectives must believe that she's just this innocent bystander, right? She just happened to have sex with Chris person i mean she literally tries to act like their relationship was barely anything it was a lot casual. more than <laughs> yet her phone logs showed that they called and texted not much but yet you're posing weird bikini shots in front of him in the doorway of a bathroom this is high school crap nearly every single day but nicole wants you to believe that she was actually trying to like counsel chris to repair his marriage mm. No, 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 no. And Agreed. it even gets way more obvious and gross as we continue. Agreed. And we're just going to talk about a ton of the different lies and inconsistencies because through all of her interviews and then what's outlined in the 200 pages of discovery and what is there She's as black there. and white forensic and digital evidence, there is so much that didn't match, guys. Did he mention the children's name or his significant other's name? Um, I didn't know his significant other's name for a while. So if this were true, if she truly did not know Shanann's name and she didn't learn Why? of it until, you know, well after meeting Chris and starting their affair, tell me 
how is it possible that she was searching for Shanann's name and using her specific name in those searches? And those searches dated back way earlier before she even met Chris. A year. Because police found that she had been searching on Google for Chris Watts as early as August 3rd, 2017. And she didn't meet him until June 2018. And she was also searching for Shanann Watts back in January of 2018. Not a typo. Again, months before she met Chris. Feels a little gross, right? Feels a little, mm, that doesn't really make much sense. Nicole also says in this interview that she didn't learn about Shanann's pregnancy until the newspaper reported it. And the news aired about Shanann missing and Chris gave that infamous horrific interview where he's like rocking back and forth. However, computer records from the discovery show that Nicole again frequented Shanann's Facebook page, where Shanann had not only made that public tribute to Chris for Father's Day, but she also announced her pregnancy, and she would also post frequent updates about her family. And Nicole had all of this in her digital history. She was seeing it, but she was telling the officers as if they're stupid and wouldn't connect the dots that she didn't learn about this until the case was a media sensation. She crap. also said that if she had known that Shanann was pregnant, she wouldn't have been with Chris in the first place. And when she... Yet she Googled, man says I'm marrying or leaving my wife to marry his mistress. Yeah. He says this, the FBI agent stops her for a second to press her a little bit more into what she meant by this. Because obviously that could be a motive for Chris. Certainly, if Nicole found out that he was expecting a baby and she was threatening to leave him, that would be a motive for Chris to murder his family, correct? Mm -hmm. If he wanted to be with her. But then once again, her dad steps in and he tells the officer to stop asking leading questions. So in those six years though, they had two children. Yep. Um, And you said earlier, you did not know she was pregnant until reading the newspaper. So um, that never came up in any conversation. Um, There was no, no indications that that was going on. None. Um, he never hinted to anything Nothing. like that. As far as you knew, um, he was just leaving her. He had two children, and um, that was the final take on that. Yes. Okay. I think, I know why he lied to me. He lied to me because if I'd have known that he had a child on the way, I'd have never wasted my time with him in the first place. Like, none of this would ever even occur. She's also trying to look good and innocent in front of her daddy, so if he would have just told me the truth. So do you think if he found out that you, um, if, let's say this week you guys were to go look at some apartments, and this is hypothetical, but you, um, you've never found out that his wife was pregnant, would, would that have changed anything, uh, like you just said? If I knew he was, his wife was pregnant, I wouldn't be in this picture. So if his wife was not pregnant, um, and forgive me, but if, if, if he takes her out of the picture, you're never going to know that she was pregnant, right? What do you mean takes her out of the picture? Like, if, if he murdered her, she's out of the picture. You're never going to know. And the dad goes, wait, don't lead. If she was pregnant. If he can get away with murder, you're not going to. I got divorced from my wife. You say, do you understand what I'm saying here? If if she's gone, but this don't lead hypothetically, please. Don't hypothetically, lead if she, okay. you understand where I'm going. If right, you didn't you're, know, you're leading into right. questions that are if, nothing with your. If you didn't know though, wait, Nick, that she was there. Did you hear what I said? I'm not. I'm following you. I just want her to answer a question that to. She said something that's important. This interaction is just so, so, so weird because this is a quadruple murder investigation at this point. Shanann, Bella, Cece, Nico, her dad does not need to be there. He is not an attorney. She is not a minor. It makes no sense. Then she tells the detective that she needed to bring something up to them, something that she forgot to tell them previously. She said that the night after everything unfolded in one of their very many phone conversations in the early hours of the 14th, which she tried to say they didn't even speak, Chris apparently asked her what to do with the wedding Wedding ring ring. that he found of Shanann's. And her response to Chris was to pawn the ring. This was literally just a day after Shanann went missing. She tells him to pawn Shanann's wedding ring. When it's technically a missing person's case, why would you tell him to pawn it? 
everything that was left behind. So another thing, so that was Tuesday, and that was it for Tuesday, but I forgot some stuff on Monday that I did need to bring up to you guys. So Monday, um, when we were on the phone at one point, he mentioned to me, I can't even believe I have to say this, she left her wedding ring here, and I said I took something it off along of her. the lines of, does that mean you two are done? And he was like, He said, how much do you think it's worth? And I was like, he said, how much do you think it's worth? And I was like, remember hearing him say that and being like, what the fuck? And he's not. And I remember thinking to myself, like. I she's not looking at him. She's constantly like this, whatever, and looking off the side, like, look at him. I didn't even want to respond to this. And so I was like, I don't know, pawn it, man. And I was just like. I was like, I pawn jewelry all the time. I was like, I pawn jewelry a few times. I was like, it's not worth shit, though. And I was like, so I don't know if you really want to do that. And he's like, no, no. I think I'm going to get it appraised. It's a nice rock. And I was just like, okay. I just want to know what cruel and callous person on the planet would suggest 24 hours Honest. after their wife and kids go missing that he pawns the wedding ring. If she truly did think that these kids and this mother were just missing, as she said in the beginning of her interview, I thought they were just missing. The last place my mind even went to was murder. Like, I didn't even think this guy killed his wife. I mean, that, that like, yeah, okay. murder was on something on the top of my mind when I call one of my friends for three or four hours and she doesn't answer the phone. Like, that doesn't even process to me as, like, a real thing that is a possibility at that point. If that's truly what she thought, and she thought that she would possibly return, why on earth would you suggest pawning it? Exactly. So which is it, Nicole? You said that murder is something that you never even thought about being a possibility, and you thought that they would come back. But then if they did come back, what do you think would happen if Shanann came home and she was looking for her ring, and it was gone, and exactly. it had been pawned? I also want to know, was this before or after the point when she, quote, thought that his lies weren't adding up and she wanted to cut him off? Mm -hmm. In the interview that she had the day before, which was in a public park, she said that she had never been there. Um, so when we spent time together, I didn't really, like, go to his house. Like, we would spend time at my house. Um... So you, when, during your guys' dating time, did you guys spend most of the time at your place? Always. She even goes in further to this detail and like tries to bolster this claim even further by saying that the dinner that they had at the Lazy Dog Cafe was the only time that they had ever been in public together. You guys, was there anything else? Uh, that you did just, was it just dinner? Did you go anyplace else to visit him? No, we just went to dinner. And that's one of the only times I've actually ever been out in public with him. However, the next day, after learning that they needed her cell phone records, boop, like magic, she remembered that she did go there twice. I've been to that house twice, but it was very, very brief. And later on in a written statement in September, she said that she had only been there twice, once on July 4th and once on the 14th. And then on the 13th of August. But once again, as if we are thinking that she's going to stop lying, she's not. Because Maury, as Maury says, that was a lie. Because later when she was talking about her and Chris's trip to Bandemir Raceway and what they did that day, she says, And then I don't remember what we did after Bandemir. I think we just went to his house. I'm almost positive. Uh -huh. we, we, um, we did that, and then we went to Bandemir, and then I don't know what we did after Bandemir. I think we just... How do you not remember? We just went to his house. I'm almost positive. Like... Well, the dates will get you every time, Nicole, because that trip that you guys took to Bandemir was on July 21st. Oh! That would be the third day that you were there, if you were saying. So technically, she was there for four times because the morning of the murders. I don't care if people get mad at me. She wasn't there. I wholeheartedly believe that she was there. And you were already there on the 4th and the 14th. <laughs> the 21st is a third day, my friend. So going back to the timeline of the murders, Nicole has absolutely zero, zilch, nil, null, none, no alibi for the time of she the doesn't. murders. Nothing. She didn't clock into work until 3 p.m. that day either. And not only did she not clock in until 3 p.m. that afternoon, but her activity while she was at work for a very short window of time was kind of sketchy. It and was. we're going to get into that in a minute too. Oh boy. So let's Here we go. start with the morning of the murders. 
A neighbor reported seeing a truck very similar to the one that Nicole owned, and okay. the neighbor said that she saw it outside of the Watts family home. At that same right where Chris parked. Same time this neighbor saw the truck, Nicole's phone pinged at a tower in Frederick, Colorado, which is where the Watts family home was, and it pinged at 6:16 a.m. But Nicole lived 25 minutes away. So why is it pinging at 6 in the morning, the morning of the murders, near Chris's family home when you live 25 minutes away? And you might think, okay, Annie, well, we know that phone pings could, might not always be accurate because a certain oh, cell phone can coverage a large area of space. Sure. She's probably going to say this, but the only other times that it pinged in Frederick, Colorado was when she was at the, the house, the two other times, well, technically three other times, and pinged in frederick colorado the morning of the murders she didn't contact chris she called to jim but she pinged in frederick colorado how does this not light up law enforcement's awareness ding but what's interesting is that when they FaceTimed the night before for that two-hour conversation, remember the night before the murders or like the early morning hours of? Yep. Her phone did ping near her house, not in Frederick. Ah. So if her phone is located in her home, it's pinging near her home. Makes sense. If her phone is not at her home, it wouldn't be pinging near her home. And it would be exactly. pinging wherever her phone was closest to, which happened to be a tower right next to Chris Watts' house. So that ping happened at 6.16 a.m., and she didn't make any phone calls that day until 2.26 p.m. that afternoon. However, her entire phone history was in the discovery, and when you analyze it, guys, it, it is pretty wild. Her. Because you can see that every single day, she makes at least one phone call per hour. She's always on her phone. She was There's silent never that a gap, morning. Not in her entire history. Besides I went back, I think, like 90 days even to just pull the data, and she never has a gap like she did on the morning of the murders from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. without making a single phone call. I did the exact so that exact same thing. Along with no alibi leads me to believe that it's because she knew that she messed up by using her phone that morning and then she stopped for the remainder of the day until she was closer to where she lived, closer to work. Exactly. Again, circumstantial, but like very clear as day. Kind of feels almost like Casey Anthony where it's like it like slaps you in the face like, hell, the evidence is right here, right here. And they're like, I don't see any evidence. Where, where do you guys see it? right here like, there's not enough proof to make it concrete 100 percent. which yes there is sorry just my opinion but like the writing is on the wall right it is so she gets to her office around 2 p.m that afternoon and then her phone shows that the next call that she made was at 2 26 p.m like i mentioned which is right before she made two other calls from her office at 2 28 p.m and 2 35 p.m back to back and i'm gonna bring that up shortly because those calls are important yeah, they are so in addition to that i decided to look even further into her phone records to just kind of say like okay could it be a fluke Maybe it did just coincidentally ping there. Maybe it was an error. It did and not. I not only looked at her history of her phone records, but I also looked at her phone records all the way up until mid-September, over a month later, a month she after Googled the murders, them again. And never once did her phone ping again in that same area as it did the morning of the murders. Well, that part is true too, but she also Googled Shanann and Chris multiple times after the murders happened. At 6.16 a.m., which would make sense because at that point, her relationship with Chris was donezo. He was arrested. He was pleading guilty. So she had no reason to be over near his house. And therefore, over a month later after the murders, there was not a single ping near his home in sight. The last one being the day of the murders. So you tell me, what are the chances of it never pinging there again if it truly was a tech error or a fluke? It, it a seems error. more likely to me that it never pinged there again because she, in fact, never, never went, went to the Watts house again. Now, all we know about is the phone ping that morning, and she did clock out of work at 3 p.m. right after making those two phone calls from the office, one at 2.28 p.m. and the other at 2.35 p.m. Those phone calls were to her spiritual advisor, a 73-year-old man named Robert of the Ordo Templi Ordinance. 
Now, one of the major features and core teachings of this organization from this spiritual leader and the spiritual leader that she called back to back that day right after getting into the office is the practice of sex magic. Now, similar to many secret societies, the membership is allegedly based on an initiation system with a series of degree ceremonies. We've talked about this before. That use some sort of ritual drama. So then after those calls are made to her spiritual advisor, she immediately leaves the Anna Darko office. And that's when she went to meet her friend Jim at her apartment at approximately 3.45 p.m. Then at 5.01 p.m., Nicole calls Chris twice, but both calls go unanswered, and she deletes those calls from her phone log. At 5.30 p.m., Chris calls her. This call also goes unanswered, but she again deletes it from her phone log. Tell me this, if you're deleting phone calls on the day of a murder, and you had no idea what was going on, and you had no idea they were even missing, and your phone also coincidentally pinged there that morning, and then you get to work late, and then you call your spiritual advisor, and now you're deleting phone logs the day of the murder, when you are saying that you had no idea anything was even afoot until days later, why are you deleting your phone records? Mm -hmm. Why are you pinging at his house that morning? It doesn't make any sense. But the community that supports Chris Watts and Nicole Kessinger think that he, they're both innocent. Where do they come up with this idea? The information is in front of our faces. Sense. At 11.09 p.m. on the night of the murders after Shanann was reported as missing, there was a 51-minute phone call between the two of them. But then it was deleted from her phone Eight Shocker. minutes later. Again, why are you deleting your phone records immediately you after if you him. have nothing to hide? Then at 12.09 a.m., Chris calls Nicole back for another 31 minutes. Then at 1.12 a.m., Nicole calls Chris back. I was deleting my messages from my um, girlfriend back in high school because I didn't want my parents to see it. Why would you delete pictures or why would you delete things? Because you don't want somebody to see them back again and they talk for three minutes then at 1 51 a.m chris calls nicole again and they talk for another eight minutes so why are they going back and forth and calling each other so much talking to each other so much it feels like something's off almost as if they're saying like yeah they're talking about something and then they're like okay yeah let me do this real quick let me look at this i'll call you right back mm. hang up call you let me go back and forth hey here's what i'm thinking it did hey i'm calling you because like It just doesn't make sense. It does not. Why call back and forth four or five times rather than have just one constant conversation? Something just feels off. Now, here comes the absolute critical phone exchange that leads me to believe that Nicole was involved somehow or knew more than she was letting on. So all of these calls are flying back and forth. Nothing's making any sense. And now comes the critical phone exchange that really does lead me to believe that Nicole is more involved than she is making Puts it out to be. the nail in the com- coffin. After that exchange of phone calls, at 1.58 a.m., Chris and the detective start playing phone tag. And the detective says that every time he tried to call and connect to Chris's phone, his personal phone would have dead air on his line. So then Chris would call him back, and once again, there would be dead air. So he would call Chris back, then there would be dead air, like something wasn't connecting, like the phone call wasn't connecting. And this goes on for nearly 10 minutes. Then Chris takes a break in calling the detective back for just one single minute, and he calls Nicole in that break. Now, why take a break to call Nicole when you and the detective are so clearly trying to connect and get in touch with each other? So he calls Nicole really quickly from that same phone, from his personal phone, and they talk for less than one minute. Then one minute later at 2.07 a.m., Chris calls the detective back. But this time, he calls from his work phone, not his personal phone. So now, at that exact same time that he is having this conversation with the detective, at that same moment, at 2.07 a.m., Nicole calls Chris's personal phone. And remember, he was talking to the detective on his work phone. Now, that phone call lasts for 11 minutes, and it was the final call between Chris 
and Nicole. So it's suspected that the dead air during the phone tag with a detective was Nicky Chris and- trying to add Nicole to the line as a listener, a three-way calling situation. And it just wasn't connecting, which is why they had to play phone tag and go back and forth. And then when it finally didn't connect, he's like, I'm just going to call him from my work phone. I'll put it on speaker. You call me on my personal phone and you can listen into the conversation. So he hangs up with her, then he calls the detective from his work phone, she calls the personal phone to listen in. Now guys, I know that this sounds wild, but the phone call log is all outlined in the discovery. I am not making any of this up. It is there in black and white. Do we know that she listened in for a fact? No. But what else could be the reason for him to have her on his personal phone simultaneously while he is talking to the detective on the work phone? How does that equate at all? Exactly. And for the exact same amount of time, the same duration for both phone calls. In addition to the deleted calls on Nicole's phone, there were hours, 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 hours worth of searches for Shanann Watts after the murders happened. And Nicole deleted all of those searches. So did she want it to look like she wrote off Chris completely and didn't care about anything pertaining to him? I mean, why delete them if you are just curious about updates and you have nothing to hide? Especially if you're trying to act like you're being so forthcoming to the police. In addition to deleting all of the history of searches, calls, text message, all of those things, Nicole also tried to destroy her SIM card before giving her phone to the investigators. But apparently all of us YouTubers are making that up. Now, one of the biggest things through this, as if there aren't enough, but one of the biggest things that doesn't quite sit right with me in this case is how she's trying to play both the victim and also the martyr. Yes. Now, for the victim role, she tells the police that Chris told her that he and Shanann were separated. They were in the process of divorcing, mutually divorcing. Yet, if he truly told her that, then why would she be Googling things like this? Man I'm having an affair with says he will leave his wife. This is a search from July 24th. If you thought that they were in fact separating or divorcing, you certainly wouldn't be using the word affair or mistress in your searches, Mm -hmm. right? Because honestly, nobody looking at Shanann's Facebook page would ever be under the impression that That she was nearing the end of a mutual divorce, as Nicole claimed to believe. Now, sure, being the other woman hardly implicates you of murder, but if you're lying about what you understood his marital status to be when there are several things to prove otherwise, you have to ask why. I mean, aside from the obvious shame in all of it. Again, that was just a super brief summary of really key details that are worth mentioning, but there's plenty more where that came from. So if you missed any of my other videos where we like really went in and did a deep dive of all of it, then definitely go check out those videos after finishing this one. I will link them in the description area. Now let's get into updates in this case. Since Chris's arrest and his sentencing in 2018, he has managed to pretty much consistently stay in the headlines for one reason or another. I mean, this case, yes, is arguably probably one of the most well-known true crime cases, right up there with John Bonet, with Casey Anthony, things like that. So Chris could probably just honestly like sneeze or get a haircut and it would be headline news. (laughs) On top of all of that, though, you're probably also familiar with the Netflix documentary that came out in late, uh, when was it? September of 2020. And it was called American Murder, The Family Next Door. For those of you who have not seen it, I do highly recommend checking it out. I thought that it was a good depiction of the case as far as updating the public or if you're unfamiliar with the case getting an understanding of it they didn't really go in the depths of the nooks and the crannies and all the details i mean not like we all love to do right but it is a good just extra source of information if you are you know curious about this case but anyways this case was already popular before this documentary came out however after it aired the entire story just spread once again all over social media it was like wildfire it was every single place that you look. Now, as you can imagine, when the documentary first came out, it quickly became the most viewed show on Netflix. And the fact that it ever even hit that record, whether it still holds that record today or not, just really shows the immense reach that this entire case really had. Now, a huge question that everybody wants to know when any true crime case is covered, especially covered so widely that there's a documentary like this one had, is how the murderer reacted to it. 
and that was no different with Chris. He was pissed. Now, while we never got an answer directly from him, a supposed friend of his who allegedly has regular visits with Chris and has talked with him, they've spoken out since that documentary first aired. The source, who has remained unnamed, claimed that the documentary puts Chris in what he describes as being a very dark place. That's a direct quote, which it's a pretty vague description also. But this alleged friend claimed that the more in-depth reason for this was basically because Chris knew that it was out there, but that he never realized that he would never be able to watch it, which I've got to say is kind of laughable because... Obviously, I mean, you're in prison. You probably don't get Netflix is my guess. But I guess maybe it was a fear of the unknown when it came to his portrayal. And that's what put him into this dark place. I don't know. One aspect of the documentary, though, that Chris really wasn't happy about was the text messages that were shown between him and his wife, Shanann. His friend is quoted as saying, quote, he can't see it and he'll probably never see it. He's curious about it, but he hates even knowing that his text messages are out there for the public to read. Just ask your mom about it. She'll tell you. It brings back awful memories of 2018 for him. Okay, fair. I wouldn't want it if my text messages were out there for public consumption. Certainly not. I say a lot of, you know, off the wall stuff sometimes. Not threatening, but like things I just probably won't want public, right? Nobody would. But here's the deal. If your friend is speaking out now about how awful this documentary made you feel and how the portrayal of yourself is what you're concerned about, it feels a little gross to me. And this is just my opinion. Also, borderline narcissistic. And I know people like to throw that word around there, but I'm throwing it. That you're worried about the text messages and the public reading your text messages. And that's what brings you back to this horrible memory of 2018. You're not worried about them knowing that you killed your two children, your three children, actually, because your unborn child and your wife. You're more worried about the portrayal and of them seeing your text messages. That's what's triggering the awful memory of 2018. It's not the fact that you literally annihilated your family in one of the worst ways I have ever heard in my entire life of consuming true crime. I'm lucky they don't have a gun. Okay. Like, Okay. Now, another source from this time, apparently from inside the prison, told People Magazine that the documentary has brought Chris a lot of shame. Good. Thank God. Specifically, this source told People, quote, Chris knows that every part of his life is out there for public consumption. He hates it. It makes him feel a lot of shame. But he also knows that he brought it upon himself. He knows exactly what he did. He's haunted by what he did. He says he can't shake the memories of his family and they haunt him. He is in his own psychological torment every day of his life. He knows he deserves it though. He knows that he made many mistakes in his life and this is his punishment. Which, okay, that feels like a better reaction. So Mm -hmm. is that a possible shred of remorse I hear? Probably not, but maybe it could be construed as that. But at least now we're finally understanding He literally said that he doesn't want to be looked at for the one time in his life where he actually did something wrong. All the other times is what he wants to be known for. Well, you kind of messed it up there, Chris. Standing that he lives in this psychological torment, which, good. I wish it was physical torment, just my opinion. But okay, fine. We'll settle for psychological. Now, the age-old argument when it comes to sick people like Chris is, what would be worse, living out the rest of his days in prison or the death penalty? Now, we obviously know that he was sentenced to life in prison, so let's just go over a little bit about what his daily routine is. At first, he was in prison in Colorado, but because of how close to home this case was, he allegedly was transferred for safety reasons to Dodge Correctional Institute in Wisconsin. Now, he's apparently on lockdown for 23 hours a day. There's one hour that he does get where he has freedom, and that's spent either showering or working out, something like that. Now, being so heavily locked down comes with a very large number of inmates who would love to get their hands on him, right? So were he to be thrown in with everybody else, he would probably end up dead on the prison's watch, most likely, which is a hassle that nobody wants to deal with when you are working for the prison. But a lot of the times that we see in not only with like we always hear when it's like child cases and things like that inmates of course go after the perpetrators but also when it is a case where it's somebody who is extremely high profile regardless what the crime was and what they committed i have a feeling and it's just my just a tingle feeling 
and I'm not wishing any harm to Chris because I'm an actual human being of care and stuff like that. I want him to serve out his sentence. I did want him to have the death penalty. Um, well, I still do. Um, but I want him to suffer too. But I think that this man will not outlive his 40s. I just have a feeling. I don't know what it is. I don't think he's going to make it past his 40s. Like past to 49, 50 years old. He's 39, so he has years on him. But something I just have inside me, just, I have this feeling. I don't know what it is. Generally, uh, there are a lot of times where they're segregated as well for those reasons, just strictly for being high profile, because inmates want to target them. They either want the notoriety of hurting or killing that person because they know then they will become high profile. It, it, sometimes it's resentment towards this person who's high profile, who's getting all this money put on their books, all of these fangirls reaching out, all of this stuff. But they almost go in like what you could call, not like the shoe, obviously, it's not that, but like high profile segregation, which is not called that, but it just makes people hate you even more, not just for the crimes and for killing, you know, innocent children, but just for being high profile. Now, apparently, Chris knows himself that he has a major target on his back. Got and according to the New York Post, Chris is actually terrified of being savagely attacked. He's not dumb. He knows that people who kill women and children are not by any means considered cool or hands off in prison. Certainly not. That little glimpse, though, of his daily life came from a news article pretty early on in his prison sentence. Apparently now there's been rumors that he's working as a custodian in prison. So maybe now he is getting a little bit more time out of his cell. Who knows? But something does tell me he probably is still kept pretty secluded, even if that rumor is actually true about the custodial duties. But the only two things he's permitted inside of his cell are a Bible and a picture of the family. The family that he so brutally, so murdered, callously which I think is wrong. murdered. So apparently, you can imagine, like many prisoners do, it's a tale as old as time, Chris has found the Lord, according to him. Apparently, he often spends time in his cell not only reading his Bible, but also reading scripture passages aloud to that photo of his family of Shanann, Bella, and Cece, reading the scripture to them. Too late, my friend. Too, Too mother late. effing late. Now, when he's not busy with his Bible study, he's writing letters. And in an HLN special titled Killer Dad, Chris Watts Speaks, Chris's mom, Cindy, actually reads a small paragraph in one of the letters that was written to her by her son, Chris. The letter read, I'm still a dad. I'm still a son. No matter what. Now, I can add... You're still a son, but you ain't no dad. You ain't no husband. You you lost all that. Servant of God to that mix. He has shown me peace, love, and forgiveness. And that's how I live every day. Now, guys, I know I've been kind of sharing my opinion a lot throughout this video, so I'm not going to share what I think about that. I'm just going to make a little... <laughs> roll my eyes so hard to the back of my brain that I can see my brain. But, okay, fine. You know, I need to, like, get it together. All right, guys, sorry. Promise. From this point on, I'm going to be a little bit more poised people obviously have a lot of feelings on this though right newfound religion aside more than anything though they're not happy with him apparently still calling himself a dad which is what he called himself in that letter his mom cindy watts is a whole other topic of conversation and we could go on a very long one. rant about that none of it is good she's been extremely vocal from the very start about her support for chris and she has said bad things about shanann even which is insane and absolutely mind-blowing taking shanann out of the picture though i cannot comprehend how you could say that you ever loved your granddaughters just to turn right around exactly. and then speak so highly of the person who murdered them and has admitted to murdering them in such great detail it makes me absolutely sick. and yet the people that defend shanann bella and celeste are the ones that are chastised um or completely bullied because we believe this when we can see it right in front of our faces sick and like i said that's a whole other rant that we don't even need to be getting into if you do want the deep dive let me know in the comments but i'm trying to keep it Kosher. clean here so apparently cindy isn't the only a person that chris is writing to either in all of this not at all here's where all of the women who have some reason to obsess over these women. disgusting men in prison come into play because chris like wade wilson the tattooed faced 
serial killer has been getting so much fan mail from all over the place for years now. Countless women have been writing to Chris, just hyping him up, telling him that they know that he's a good person, that they feel drawn to him for whatever reason, blah, 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 blah. And some of these women will literally even send scandalous photos of themselves in bikinis, underwear, sometimes even naked, and just take a look at one of these letters that somebody sent to him. It says, I won't lie, I've seen the news, but it's not my reason for writing to you. You honestly have one of the kindest faces I've ever seen. I don't even know you, yet I don't want you to feel alone. You also very much remind me of somebody that I used to know. You can do as you please with this letter. Of course, I would love to hear from you, talking about whatever you wish to talk about, but if for Gosh. some reason you feel you are unable to write, then I'll completely understand that too. I've included a photo of me so you can put a face to the name. Maybe then I won't feel like such a stranger to you. Now this will never not irk me, the amount of women who reach out to these people. And I don't know if it's because women typically have kind of like this savior complex of I can save him, I can, you know, I can rehabilitate him, whatever the things are. But she's talking about how he has such a kind face. You know who also had the kindest faces? His daughters that mm -hmm. looked just like him. And don't get it twisted, Chris responds to many of these letters. It's not like he just reads them, then doesn't play into it at all, then goes about his day. Oh, I mean, it. he has all of the time in the day to read these, just like he reads the Bible passages over and over and over again. So he also responds to romantic and sexual letters. I don't know, maybe he's just bored, maybe it's because he's trying to get more money on his books, I don't know. But since we're on the topic of letters, let's get into perhaps one of the craziest letters, letters that Chris has written while in prison. An author named Sherilyn Cadle started writing back and forth to Chris, and Sherilyn claimed that like many of us, she heard about the case and was immediately fascinated. At one point, she was even able to meet with Chris in person. Now, for whatever reason, Chris was always more than happy to talk with her. Maybe it was because he felt like this could be his chance to kind of tell his own story Mother and his figure, words, maybe? since uh. he never really got to with that documentary I mentioned earlier. I don't know. Maybe she was able to, and I use this word very loosely, almost manipulate him with his newfound religion. But these letters were incredibly controversial for many reasons, so I want to get right into them. In these letters, he described in vivid recollection how the murders went down. And in one of the letters that has since been released, Chris wrote, August 13th, the morning of, I went to the girls' room first, before Shanann and I had our argument. I went to Bella's room, then Cece's room, and I used a pillow from their bed to kill them. That's why the cause of death was smothering. After I left Cece's room, then I climbed back into bed with Shanann, and our argument ensued. After Shanann had passed, Bella and Cece woke back up. I'm not sure how they woke back up, but they did. Bella's eyes were bruised, and both girls looked like they had been through trauma. That made the act that much worse, knowing that I went to their rooms first, and knowing I still took their lives at the location of the batteries. August 12th, when I finished putting the girls to bed, I walked away and said, quote, That's the last time I'm going to be tucking my babies in. I knew what was going to happen the day before, and I did nothing to stop it, end quote. In another released portion of the letters, Chris also described killing his wife, Shanann. He says, Isn't it weird how I look back and what I remember so much is her face getting all black with streaks of mascara? All the weeks of me thinking about killing her, and now I was faced with it. When she started to get drowsy, I somehow knew how to squeeze the jugular veins until it cut off the blood flow to her brain, and she passed out. The girls were kind of just running around the house and watching me with scared looks on their faces. Bella started to cry, and when she did, Celeste started whimpering. What a nightmare this was. A common theme in a lot of these letters is Chris's spiritual awakening. He talks about it, like a lot, 
And in another letter to this woman, Chris closed the letter out by saying, quote, I don't know if this was a spiritual visit, but I had a dream that Cece was dancing next to the chair in my cell. When she was dancing, all of my folders on the chair started moving, and I thought that she was in trouble. So I said, watch out, get away, watch out. Then I woke up. I'm hoping that she comes back. He's I hope losing everyone his mind. comes to visit me. I'm trying to see if I can clear my head better before I go to sleep to help. I like that John 10, 10 passage you sent. I wish I could have had an open ear to hear the Lord calling me back in June, July, and August. If we run after sin, we won't hear our shepherd calling us. I couldn't discern between the good spirits and the evil spirits, and that eventually lodged me into a deep pit that I couldn't climb back out of. Take care and God bless, Chris. So this back and forth between mm. Sherilyn and Chris was ultimately turned into a book in 2019 called Letters from Christopher, The Tragic Confession. I personally have not read it, but from the slew of one-star reviews, it seems like I'm not missing out on anything. Now, I want to get well, into some of those updates on what's been happening between Chris and Nicole and what's going on these days. Before I get into it, just know that Chris's thoughts and opinions on Nicole are very, very wishy-washy. One day he's saying something bad about her, the next day he's not. In 20 You know how we can fix this? Bring in Nicole Kessinger and let's talk to her. Come on. Bring her on in. Let's do it. 21, an inmate at the same jail as Chris, named David Carter, spoke to the Daily Mail. And what he had to say was pretty interesting. But we also need to take it with a grain of salt because sometimes inmates will say anything. But anyway, according to David, Chris and Nicole were in contact with each other after his sentencing. He claimed that Chris never went into detail about what she wrote to him other than the fact that she said she needed to speak to him to clear things up. David says that he has even taken pictures of these letters that are supposedly from Chris. I guess just to prove that he really does know Chris and had a relationship with him, I don't really know. But apparently in that book that I just mentioned, Chris also told Sherilyn that he was still in love with Nicole and that he believes that some of these women who have been writing to him are actually Nicole writing to him, He's all just... under a different name. And this David guy told the Daily Mail that he doesn't know if that's actually true or not, or if Chris just believes it to be true in his own head. It's Again, his take head. all of that with a grain of salt, though, because David could have completely made up everything, or maybe he didn't, and Chris was the one making things up. I don't know. It's all just rumors and speculation at this point. Now, keep everything that we just mentioned in mind, because... All of that was pretty positive in regards to Nicole, right? They were talking. He's still in love with her. They talked after his sentencing, all of those things. Well, now we're going to get into the not-so-good things that Chris has allegedly said about her. Now, what we're about to go over is super recent, like in the headlines this summer of 2024, that recently. So let me start with a little bit of a backstory. In the same prison as Chris, in the cell right next to him was Dylan. a man named Dylan Tallman. Dylan was in prison for narcotics, and during his sentence, he also found God. So Dylan and Chris, being next to each other and both on this whole spiritual journey, apparently they started getting closer together. Dylan claims that they started talking frequently and studying the Bible together. He said that Chris began calling him his spiritual twin. Maybe that's a new take on a twin flame. I don't know. But apparently this spiritually fueled relationship between the two of them made them come up with the idea of writing their own book. The book would be about their own crimes and also their prison journeys. However, it was going to be heavily focused on the religious and spiritual sides of their lives. So after about a year, the f that book which came out which was the 40 days of something i can't believe it or i can't remember what it was exactly but it's pretty much rewritten scripture and them claiming that it's theirs year of planning this three-part series book which they were calling the cell next door Dylan claimed that Chris backed out of it for whatever reason of course he did. Dylan however didn't care though he wanted to still go through with it so now, two parts of the series have been released. And if it's to be believed, it has third. got a whole lot of tea in it. And Nicole is a headlining character. The first book apparently gets right into it. Dylan claimed that he and Chris referred to Nicole as a Jezebel. If you aren't familiar, Jezebel is a biblical figure in the Old Testament, who for many reasons I'm not going to get into, is depicted as somebody who is manipulative, insidious, and has evil characteristics and tendencies. 
So if you do ever get called a Jezebel, just not know good. it is certainly not a compliment. According to the first book, Chris told Dylan, quote, I was having an affair with this girl and I ended up in love with two women at the same time. It's what led up to what happened. She is. He literally sat there and said that he lost his love for Shanann. So now he's saying that he loves them both of evil spirits like Jezebel. So in book one, Chris is allegedly blaming the murders on Nicole and saying that her evil spirit manipulated him into doing what he did. That is, of course, if this is all actually believed to be true in this book. He'll come up to a lie detector. We can find out. Now, as if that's not already insane enough, Dylan had more on the topic of Nicole's evil spirit as well claiming that on the night of the murders, Nicole allegedly told Chris that he had to choose between her or Shanann and the girls. Then, quote, Jezebel was the forbidden fruit, and it was costly, end quote. Apparently, during the time when they were planning the books, but before Chris had backed out, Dylan claims that he and Chris encouraged each other to write letters to God, and one of these alleged letters is We've also read. now public. It's signed by Chris, and it's dated March 3rd, 2020. The letter reads, Dear Heavenly Father, I have backslidden. I am like a sheep gone astray from the flock, and I have fallen into a pit. The snare of the enemy has entrapped me. The words of a harlot has brought me low. Her flattering speech was like drops of honey that pierced my heart and soul, but little did I know all her guests were in the chamber of death. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life? How did I not see it? How did I let this happen? The blessings you have bestowed upon me were right in front of me, and I still followed the perfume of a strange woman. The web of the enemy squeezes around my heart and is cocooning my soul to the point of suffocation. The enemy and his Jezebel mock and scourge me as they celebrate another capture. But oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. You, O oh Lord, did not leave me captive or condemned. You heard the prayer of the destitute and of the prisoner appointed to death. You opened my eyes. You made my ears ready to perceive, and you said, Come forth. The web of death loosened its grip, and I walked into the light of your presence. As I humbly kneeled before you, you said, go and sin no more. Your faith has made you whole. Which, I know, that was a whole lot of intensity, right? So was it Jezebel, aka Nicole's fault? Or are you still in love with her and she's still writing to you? Who really even knows the truth? And I am curious to know what you guys- But I'm telling you, if they made a third and final, like, interview, like, you know how you, like, one strike, two strike, three strikes, like, if they did that, because we had the first confession, we had his confession in February when he was at Wisconsin, and if we do one more, I feel like everything would be laid out. Give him a lie detect. Don't even bring Nicole Kessinger in. Give this man a lie detector and ask him, was Nicole there that morning? Was Nicole involved? Did Nicole Kessinger help? All those three. Those three would sign, seal, deliver this case. I don't know how they didn't ask it, to be, to be frank, before. Why didn't they ask, was your mistress involved? That's all they had to say guys think but taking out all of the religious aspects out of the first book's story could there be some truth to what dylan was alleging that chris told him i, I mean so. we've all kind of been saying over and over again how nicole's story just does not add up at all she's told constant lies her timestamps don't match up her phone pings don't match she up didn't. her stories don't match up which again if you haven't watched my deep dive only dedicated to nicole where i kind of debunk it was very good. a lot I of it to it I will link it because I go through hours and hours of her interrogation footage, thousands of pages of discovery and documents, and there are a lot of inconsistencies. So I'm just going to leave it at that and let mm -hmm. everybody come to their own conclusions. But my question in all of that is, did she maybe give him some type of ultimatum like that book is alleging? Maybe not by straight up saying, hey, murder your family and be with me. But you know what I mean, kind of insinuating like, hey, if you're still with them or if they're still around in the next week or so, I'm out. I'm like going to find somebody new. I don't know. Is she kind of, she pretty much did that by saying that, oh, I'm still dating around. 
I had a couple dates, but they stood me up. Like she's showing that, Oh, I had a couple dates, but they stood me up. Like it's there, but it's not like the temptation of her saying that they're, she's still wanted by other men. It makes Chris like, Oh, I need, I, I gotta get this taken care of. I need to get, I need to get her under my, my wing, my, my spell because I'm losing her kind of thing. That's what I just think. This story just confirming what a lot of us have wondered for years just like with the other inmate, though, who spoke out, we can't really take what Dylan is saying to be the complete truth. We know that people lie all the time. I mean, heck, put that man up to a lie detector. Ask him some questions. So who knows if we'll ever know whether any of that was true or not. News outlets have tried to contact Nicole for a long time now, especially about all of this now and that this has been released. But thing. they have, of course, had no luck. When everything went down, she allegedly moved out of state, changed her name. Some news state. articles now say that she is back in Colorado living under a different name, but nobody really knows what she's doing these days. Nicole Lee Miller, Nikki Lee Miller. We know what her name is. These days, maybe she's seen how much she's talked about and she's purposefully just trying to stay as far away from the limelight as possible. I mean, she'd be smart for it. I just can't help but wonder what her thoughts are, though, on all mm -hmm. of this that's being said. I also wonder why she has stayed tucked away for so long. I get it. There's a lot of people who think she had something to do with it. But she wants to live her life. She doesn't want anybody intriguing or in intervening. She wants to live her life. And she doesn't have children. She has fur babies. But... If you didn't, if you truly didn't, and, a significant and other. I've never been in that situation, so I'm just thinking out loud, but why not get ahead of it? Why not get out in front of it just like Amber Fry did with Scott Peterson? She was the mistress. If you had nothing to do with it, if it was all unbeknownst to you, even if you knew that he was married, but like you had nothing to do with the murders, why not just give an interview? Say that. People are going to rip you apart regardless, whatever, no matter We've what you say, they long. already are doing that. So why feel like you need to live in this like dark cave the rest of your life? I don't know. Again, I've never been in her situation, so I'm just thinking out loud and comparing it to the Amber Fry situation, but tell me what you think. Now, as for Chris, this past May, he celebrated his 39th birthday all by Alone. himself. A spokesperson for the prison stated that he received absolutely no special treatments and that he also did not have a single person lined up to visit him on his that birthday. Would suck. Which good. His birthdays were once spent with somebody who loved him, right there by his side, his kids, followed Idiot. by years of babies and happiness, blowing out the birthday candles, his kids probably singing happy birthday to him. And now there's emptiness. There's nothing, which in my opinion is exactly how it should be. Yes. And I can't help but wonder if on his birthday he looked at his family's picture that is hanging on his cell wall and wondered for even a single brief moment what that day could have looked like had he never committed such horrific, heinous murders that August day, exactly. had that day never happened. I want to know what you guys think about all of this. Not only the Nicole aspect of it and whether or not she was, she I'd wasn't involved, why she's Anna hiding Lise. out, why not get ahead of it. But also if he blames her, if he is taking accountability, if he truly has found God. And aside from everything we just talked about, I also want to know from you guys, why do you think this case still is in the limelight the way that it is. It still is Nicole. one of the most notorious cases out there and people are talking about it, there's news about it, and I wonder why it has such a grasp on the true crime community especially because we have talked about family annihilators at nauseum, right? Like so many of them, unfortunately. So what is making this one different? Is it because of the way Chris looks? And it's I mean Nicole. that because it's he's had Nicole. so many fangirls reaching out very similar to wade wilson so is that going is that kind of following the blueprint and is the wade wilson case going to become the next chris watts case for the next five to seven years hopefully not but i'm just curious what you guys think about i know a lot of you guys want me to get into the wade wilson case which i can but i didn't know if you guys would want me to so hashtag will was wade wilson not only all the updates, but the case in general. Again, all of those deep dives will be linked. And if you want the deep dive good. even further on like the whole case, start to finish, even if you know the case, you <coughs> want to know about his mom, her involvement with like him in prison and how she's been advocating for him. The Nicole deep dive, like I'm talking, it will be like a mega deep dive. It'll probably be like two hours long, maybe even longer. 
let me know in the comments. Just say like deep dive yes so that I can find that easily. Or if you're good, I understand that too. Anyways, that's all I've got for you today from Watts Island, but hopefully you found this update informative. I will definitely keep you updated on all the other cases and new information in this case if it comes to light. And if you do end up wanting that deep dive, if I see a big response for that, I will certainly put that together and put that on here. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, make sure you do that now. It's totally free. Love. Just hit subscribe. And as a last call reminder, we are going on live tour, guys. We are going to be doing exclusive cases in person, recording these episodes, meet and greets, surprise guests, all of the things. So don't miss those. It's a very short window, but all of the dates and venue and city information, because we're going to a bunch of different cities, can be found at AnnieElise.com and then hit the events tab. I'm gonna go check all it. right, guys, thanks so much. And until the next one, stay safe. Bye. So with that being said, I know a lot of my community and so forth piggyback off of her question why do you think this case is so up there i still think it's because of nicole kessinger not being asked not being questioned it's literally like asking those questions and then just cutting it away it's like watching a movie that your, your favorite it's like watching your favorite movie and then stopping without finishing it would you get mad oh i would be mad <clears throat> i would Avengers Endgame, Small Soldiers, Blade, I mean, Fast and the Furious. If you cut those in half or whatever and didn't let me finish any of them, oh, I'd be pissed. I'm telling you. And that's literally what we're doing right here is we've literally found out all the evidence or we've seen a lot of the evidence. We haven't collected all of it. We were about to go to trial. Chris confessed and then they stopped it. Of course, people are going to want to know. People are going to want to find the answers. People are going to want to to find the conclusion. And we don't have the conclusion. So, with that being said, make sure you guys hit the like button, the subscribe button, comment those thoughts down below. I would surely love to read. I, I read. I'm can't trying to keep up, so bear with me. But, again, and then if you guys want me to get into the Wade Wilson case, I can definitely do that one as well. Um, start that one or wherever have you. But again, thank you guys for watching. Please take care, be safe, and as always, keep nerding on, and we'll see you guys in the next one.